Welcome, welcome very much to Conversations, and we're here, I am here in New York City, and we're testing uh, a newly revived, we haven't used it for quite a while, I'm trying to utilize Skype as a means of doing programs with people in other parts of the world, and on the other line, we have a dear old friend of mine from way back, uh, that being Stephen or Estafios Neskis, and he happens to be in, in Virginia Beach, Virginia, while I'm here in Manhattan. So it's a great pleasure to welcome a dear old friend to talk about, uh, well, communications and maybe a few points of economics and other matters. And so, Stephen, welcome very, very much to Conversation. Say hello to the New York City uh, audience. It's my pleasure, Harold, to be here. Um, as we work many different programs together uh, to bring this new Skype capability uh, into fruition. You should move uh, over, Stephen, you should move over to your left more to center it. You're, you're not centered. You're over to the left, the right side of the screen. I know, but I wanted you to see my harmonica. Oh, well, okay. Well, okay, there, that's good. Okay, good. Yeah, I can see you're still into music, huh? You've always been into music, and you play a hell of a harp, I know. But I see. I thought you were just uh, the camera got no, messed up. I was up. just hiding some of my, uh, my, my stuff back here. But as you can see, I got my guitar right here, and uh, my keyboards are back there. And that's yeah. a Kurzweil keyboard, and I'm in, and you've uh, interviewed Mr. Kurzweil um, many years ago, but he was quite an innovator, and he still is. Yeah, and that's a Kurzweil synthesizer. It's a hell of a machine. It really is. You you can play. They can play to people who are. They can play to people who are, um, you know, pianists and people that are really deeply involved in uh, in music and so forth. And people will be listening, and they cannot tell the difference between the piano playing on a Kurzweil synthesizer and a, a Steinway Grand Piano. It's really it's quite an achievement that he did in that. Yeah. Absolutely, Harold. Uh, the K26, the one I have now, is actually one model that you, uh, was utilized to make movies. Uh, so it has a capability of making many different sounds, from drums to uh, uh, thermal rains and thunder and everything that you would want to have in a movie. So it's quite uh, has quite a capability. Yeah, but, it's you know, quite. It's a really neat to be here, contemplating. Uh, at this point in time, that we have really transcended scarcity. Wait a minute. That we have these capabilities now. It's going to be nice to get into it a little bit deeper with you. Uh, that, you know, we, we've been doing videos for what? Over, I know with you, about 30 years, and you've been doing it for like 40. How long well, have you been with uh, Well, I, I would say that I guess I've been doing video uh, with, uh, with this conversation series. Actually, it was from about 1968 or 9 that I had the use of one of the very first Portapacks. They were called Portapack uh, uh, devices that came out of Japan where you could make uh, on a reel-to-reel -reel with the thing you had to carry on your hip and connect black and white 20 minutes of video, which mm -hmm. was, uh, and that had to wait for the invention of videotape, which had only happened a little bit before that. But then all the manufacturing went to Japan, and we got the use of a, one of the very first that came off the boat from Japan through uh, our friend Paul Ryan, who was one of the video pioneers, and he let me use it, so I started out and did some programming upstate before I came down to New York here. but So it's about 45 years now that I've been doing video, yeah. yeah so you are, you are a pioneer in what we call public access as well. I would when did you start public access? Well, no, that, that actually was public access because oh, we, was. I, was a, I was a professor at the uh, State University of New York campus at New Paltz, which was a sister community uptown to the Woodstock. Uh, and so forth in those tumultuous years, uh, 68 through 71. And uh, so I was doing, we were doing programming there, and uh, we were playing it there before there was public access or much a cable uh, in, in New York. So we had it going, and they had a, each of the, uh, each of the cable systems, they're like neurons in a brain uh, metaphor, 
uh, they, they would have an antenna up on a high mountain or something near the area and then they would lay the cables down like axions in the brain into the community and they had it going up there and they had a little building on top of the mountain behind uh, near Mohawk, uh, the, the great resort hotel and so forth, uh, that housed the equipment and there was a little building attended to it and one of my local friends, Bob Schuler, Dr. Bob Robert Schuler, uh, talked to the owner of that and we talked to him, Mr. Bogart was his name, and he allowed us how instead of just having the equipment, we just set up a camera and that camera was for a little while, was just playing out on the meadow, looking at rabbits and whatnot. But then he said, well, you guys, if you start doing programming, we could actually put it into the homes here in New Falls. And so we got started before there was much going on in New York City, upstate. And that's where the cable uh, systems really grew up, firstly, uh, in the first instance, in communities that were outside of the, uh, the catchment area of the over-the-air broadcast capability that had been there. Uh, so they would pick up the signal out of the air and then bring it down. So we actually got started up in New Paltz before there was something in New York. In New York City, I mean. Right, right. And your first program, uh, what did you, didn't you do somebody in government, like the vice president, or? Well, that was a little, that was a little bit down the line, yeah. Um, first program I did was a fellow professor. I was a professor there at the university. It was with uh, Sidney Greenfield. He was the first program we tried it out, much like we're trying out, you and I are trying out Skype now as an experiment. And he had been a, uh, he was a, a, a creative writer, uh, a professor of creative writing, and he was an aficionado of Wilhelm Reich the famous psychologist and also reader of things and uh, that included the the, uh, the idea of orgone energy and all that sort of thing and that's the first program we did in his apartment he had a what was called an orgone accumulator where there's yeah. orgone sort of like prana that's in the air and you can pick it up with an accumulator and I went inside it was like a privy he went inside and he asked me through over the transom, he said, how's it feel? I, I remember I said, it feels kind of heavy, you know, was the, actually, that was the term of the, the moment. But that was the first, and then we did pretty, pretty quickly get to where we went down to Washington and did programs uh, relatively early, uh, you know, with the equipment that uh, my friend Paul Ryan, and we had people who would, we were, uh, Jonas Mikas and the film anthology and the, uh, uh, the uh, filmmakers in New York City, they would come all the way, Allen Ginsberg and uh, uh, Ray Bremza and some of the great poets down in New York, they would come all the way up to New Paltz and we'd go up on top of this mountain and go into this little room, it was just a really small little room housing the equipment, sit on a, on a milk crate or something and just play the programming on Channel 12 in, uh, in New Paltz before there was anything effective. And then it wasn't until the, uh, the intervention of George Stoney, who was in a very real sense, the, he was a filmmaker, at, uh, a teacher of film, and also a filmmaker. Uh, he, he just passed a little while ago, but he was the one yeah. Who, who had made films uh, in the New Deal and so forth, beautifully made films, Hollywood quality films about, you know, Social Security and some of the things of the New Deal. And then he got an institutional structure set up that resulted finally in their being here in Manhattan, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and it got some institutional support from the cable industry for what they call public access. But. Uh, he's the real father institutionally of it. I would just make programs and put them on the local cable here in New York after I found we could do that. But that would have been 1970 or so, about the time of Woodstock. Right on, right on. Woodstock, talking about Woodstock. Our friend Richie Havens... I know, it's sad. Um, ...is passed and I got to work with him on that Common Ground album a little bit uh, with the record company Splash Mountain. Mm -hmm with all our friends in New Pulse, and that was really a, a, a really interesting time. That was the late 70s, early 80s, wasn't well, it? No, well, the 70s, it was the 70s. Actually, it was, uh, it was up and going by 70, up there. 
and they would like to see, they, um, Pull My Daisy uh, filmmakers would come up and show films and so forth, and we just, um, and some of the local people would come up and sit on, uh, uh, you have to walk through big, big snowfalls and everything to get there. It was quite a venture and everything like that yeah. up, upstate. And, yeah. and first, in the first uh, 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 Washington uh, people you interview were people like, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your Washington uh, well, experience. Well, I was uh, a great I was a uh, I, I was a sort of radically inclined uh, professor, I guess you would say. I was very much into thinking comprehensively, having done all my doctoral work and everything in geography, which is very all inclusive in terms of you can be interested in a whole lot of different things and get away with it, from weather to climate to soils to natural resources to social patterns to anthropological patterns to uh, right. you know uh, so I was very interested in things in a very comprehensive way all unknowingly to me I was just sort of drawn to that thing which was uh, finally to be identified as a, 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 a as a systems thinking or or, or pattern recognizing uh, pattern of thought in terms of the over uh, uh, of, of, of reality actually yeah and yeah. so we we did some things and we'd go down to uh, I was very impressed with the work of, uh, of Buckminster Fuller as a person who's understanding the evolutionary process and the evolutionary process within the design parameters and all of that he was a major figure in terms of reading things in a very large pattern another one was um, was Marshall McLuhan, who was often called the Oracle of the Electronic Age, another pace setter. He was in Toronto, and he had been in he had been in New York at Fordham University for a year. He had been invited by John Culkin, the director of things at uh, of uh, telecommunications at uh, Fordham, and my friend Paul Ryan had been his assistant when he was there. So it was because of Paul. That we got used to that very early porta pack and ability to make television, which is now I, ubiquitous. You know, it's on every cell phone and everything. And you had an interesting uh, experience in Washington D.C. interviewing some um, very high-powered people that were very impressed with that and actually uh, wanted you to do more, more of, the, of that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that part of your experience? Well, yeah, the, the thing in Washington, yeah, one is interested in Washington because that's the national capital and all that, and everything political yes, is. is there. And uh, that would have been, uh, for the most part, well, we went to see, there was a man, Richard Wiley, he was the director of uh, what's called the Federal Communications Commission. And at that time, there was a guy named Nichols, or Nicholson, Nichols, who was there. And the, the, the interests of cable television as a new medium, it, there was a, a, there was a uh, commission report, it was called the Sloan Commission, that uh, wrote a major work in terms of talking about the implications of the multi-channel capacity that cable was, har was heralding. And it was called uh, Cable Television, the Medium of Abundance. That was a major study. So we were in the realm, there were some cable companies and so forth, we were in the realm of cable television. And so I was very interested in that. And I would go there and talk with him. He was very welcoming, Richard Wiley. He's still with us and he's still the head of, uh, I, I think it's the largest uh, law firm in Washington on issues of cable of telecommunications policy and it's good for all citizens to keep an eye on that commission and I would do programs with him and then with others and uh, then I got interested also in economics and we're going to want to talk a little bit about you and I both were aware of um, of, uh, of uh, Lewis Kelso's Kelso. thinking yep. in terms of economic theorizing I read a lot of economics, John Maynard Keynes and Joseph Schumpeter and Karl Marx and things like that, because uh, the politics and the uh, communications are joined at the hips. So at the hip, I would go down there and do programming. And the, one of the first programs I did was with my dear old friend, who's a friend of yours also, and that being Norman Curlin. 
and a Norman, wonderful person. And wonderful we, person. We, we want to give a person. great shout out to and to let everybody know how about they can be in touch with Norman because I know you've been in touch with him and I want to get back in touch with him uh, because he's down there in Washington. But he was an advocate of the thinking of Lewis Kelso, who I think is the person who had a, a take on economics which is really behind or joined at the hip again in terms of the political process. And he has a unique way of seeing things, how capital should be formed and all that kind of thing and a take on things that I think the progressive community would be very good, well advised to think about utilizing as a way in which even if they're coming from a critique attitude toward the society, utilize as a way of uh, to quote William Shakespeare, hoisting the system on its own petard in a way that uh, he had written a book with Mortimer Adler back in 58, and um, that was called the Capitalist Manifesto, which to a, to, a, to a progressive community, that sounds like the enemy at the gate, you know, who sort of more inclined toward uh, Karl Marx and that kind of thing. But there's an awful lot of wisdom in that book, and it's something that could be containing a critique that could gain the attention of the real movers and shakers of both the political and the economic theorizing in a way that they might be able to understand and go along with, which will be the ultimate test of uh, how, much how much influence the citizenry can have in terms of shaping national and international policy. But we went down and did a program with on, a, on inaugural day in 1972 with Norman, and that was the day that Richard Nixon had been sworn into his second term. It was destined to be dashed by all the Watergate stuff. But I remember that with Norman, and we definitely want to uh, you know, give a shout out and a, a big plug to Norman. He's a pioneer in that field, along with uh, Lewis's wife. Uh, Lewis passed on in, uh, yes, I think it was 91, and his wife uh, carries on. She was his co worker, and it was uh, Norman who had had a big influence in terms of getting considerable support for the thinking of Lewis as part of a way of doing economic theorizing. Well, you know, you were influential and in, uh, instrumental in bringing uh, myself uh, with Norm Curlin. Yeah. And uh, I ended up working with him and still, to this day, believe uh, in what he's doing. Uh, he has a site called CESJ.org. That's CESJ.org. That's that. for Economic and Social Justice. Right. And... Um, it's a wonderful site, it's a think tank, uh, so you might get a little confused with all the information on it, so I would recommend clicking on the Capital Homestead tab, which is right above on the top, and, uh, and there's free e-books there uh, to, to read, and, uh, and get, get involved in it. Uh, you know, now that we're talking about uh, Louis Kelso and uh, what he had to say, basically, we are coming to a new era in, in our in, in in the you know in our life you know from Homo sapiens now we are transcending scarcity and we're actually on the verge of of utilizing all these new sciences to actually make a new speciation um, which we'll talk to in the future uh, in a little bit about that but talking about economics. We have the capability to transcend scarcity. And Keynes, on your website, and I'll, I'll give a plug to you, it's channer.tv. If you go over there and click on uh, Keynes' uh, letter, you will see that he did state this. And, and very few people actually bring this up. I don't think anybody, I haven't heard yet, bring this up, that we, number one, have transcended scarcity. And number two, what Cain said, and you can make the statement better than I. Well, let me let me let me deal with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, at the time I was a professor, I was only loosely associated or familiar or aware of Lewis as somebody who had something to say. 
And I remember I put together a series of rap sessions about my idea of education. It was kind of radical and everything. But uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was it was Marshall it was Marshall McLuhan who put me on to Lewis Kelso. And I think war, in the book he did called War and Peace in the Global Village. And I used to visit along with Paul Ryan, uh, Mr. Uh, um, um, uh, McLuhan, and he was a really interesting man. He had a really interesting way. I could never get like the Yiddish say Amish with him, but he allowed we could sit in on his class. But he was the one who introduced me or made me curious about this fellow, uh, Kelso, who had this unique take on economics. And uh, then he, and uh, it was, uh, so that so that would have been, I was just becoming aware of it. That's how I got in touch with Norman. Because I looked up in Washington, who, what think tank is there that's dealing with this? There's a lot of them around Marx, there's a lot of them around, and then the giant, John Maynard Keynes, or Lord John Maynard Keynes, the English economist who had set up virtually all of the major institutions of the latter half or, or even before, uh, at the time of the Great Depression, and also was the inspiration behind the Brenton Woods meeting after the Second World War that are, you know, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and all of the institutions, Federal, well, the Federal Reserve goes back to 1913, but he had right. set all these things up. And it was, Lou, uh, it was John Maynard Keynes had written a letter to his grandchildren in the year 1930, which presaged the, uh, he said that in their maturity, the, the, the grandchildren at that time in their maturity, which would be around now, would, uh -huh. and the society would be confronted with something very hard to understand, but that would be technologically induced massive unemployment. Isn't and, that amazing that he had the foresight to understand that? It was, uh, well, he, he, I think that's extraordinary, that he, that he would have the, the foresight to understand that technology one day would surpass having a job. So that comes to what Kelso is doing, and what we need to do is have systems that are able to bridge antiquated systems. And the Keynesian model, which we're still using today, and every president says, we got to get a job, we got to have a job. No, what we need to do is own the capital production and receive a stipend. And the younger that we receive that stipend, the better off we're going to be. So, so what... Uh, Norm is proposing to do is democratize the Federal Reserve, but they can bail out the banks at 16.6 trillion. They can loan each citizen about seven thousand dollars, which is what the economy is. Have it privately insured; it's a valid investment. And a child being born today would make 1.6 million dollars in dividends, 465 thousand in savings, with a retirement of 46 thousand dollars a year. That's now, big. That's that's big time stuff. That's big time that stuff. Big that time. That, in that's these better times. than Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid program that uh, is out there can do for us. Now, if if a child is, they're getting this the stipend. If you decrease Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid as they increase the uh, the stipends that they would get from the uh, from this program. That would be 60% of our budget right there. Do you think some major changes could happen if we could wipe out 60% of our budget? Well, I would think so, wouldn't you? But I think it's, uh, I, to look at things in a comprehensive way, I'm just going to go a little bit off kill here. We just did a, we just attended part mm -hmm. of a major conference that, would, that highlighted uh, Raymond Kurzweil. And you and I are taping this on the 14th of uh, July. This is Bastille right. Day, I guess, is it? Or, but anyway, uh, and on the 15th, tomorrow here in New York, we're going to play a program we did with Ray Kurzweil back in, uh, in 1999, the day his book, uh, The Age of Spiritual Machines, came out. And, uh, and there was a conference that is looking into the future in terms of, and Ray Kurzweil is a really interesting, I had done a program with Ray Kurzweil way back in 1974. 
He was up in the Boston area on that highway, 126 or something, with a lot of research going on. And he had invented the machine that could do, was uh, to lead to optical character generation, where you could take a piece of script and put it on like a Xerox machine, and a voice would autonomically take the script and come out. It, I remember he had a, it was for the blind. Yeah, and that's what led him. He did so many things uh, for the blind. It was, uh, it was a monumental uh, time at that point for him to, you know, to create that. Uh, it was amazing that he had that foresight. I mean, he's a very bright man in yeah. the future. And that in turn led him to get a very close association with Stevie Wonder, who was mm -hmm. blind. And they became fast friends, and uh, that's what led to him to do uh, four, I think he's made four major contributions to cybernetics in an inventor's way. And then he would get them to where they're solid, rock solid, you know, algorithmically and everything. And he understood the computer, sort of like uh, learning from uh, Norbert Wiener and the other pioneers back to Turing, uh, right. the implications of a coming exponential capability and uh, that uh, they would they they would they would get to that to that point, but uh, he, he saw that, and he had written another book, *The Age of Intelligent Machines*, in 1988, and he had projected. In, he's a futurist, and he had projected right. into the future, and he projected within about two or three months from ten years out, when the computer, it would have been an IBM uh, computer that it was developing, would be so developed that it would be able to defeat the world's chess champion. And he called that from 10 years out within about two or three months of the actual occurrence. He was really very, very prescient. And he remained so. And his latest work is he's talking about the singularity and so forth. But there was a right. conference put together uh, at uh, Alice Tully Hall just now, June 15th of this year, with major cyberneticists about introducing this idea of transhumanism to the moment in which you and I talk now, which I think is something really worthy of thinking about, that we're coming to a qualitative new trans uh, transformation in the world uh, through the technological extension of consciousness. Yeah, and he was one of the he was one of the principal speakers there, and that was a major conference. I think it'll go down in history as starting uh, the intellectual community thinking about things in a very comprehensive way that could include or subsume on their own terms the political and general intellectual class has largely been co-opted by adherence to outdated institutions that the technological development is uh, is calling into being now. Absolutely, Harold. And, uh, you know, we need these, uh, these systems, these new systems to subsume the old antiquated systems that we have right now. And, and um, you know, as a, as a futurist, I think I became a futurist when I first saw Star Trek. Ah, I think a lot of us you did, know, yeah. You know, uh, but I started dreaming about what the, what our capabilities could be. Actually, George Jetson uh, was probably the first step into that. That was a great futuristic show that, you know, we had these expectations that we would have a four-day work week uh, we would work less hours, and the world would be great, and our children would be better off than we were before. And that was going on great when uh, the Keynesian model was working in its fullest. But when you have 10 people leaving the system and only one person coming in, the system becomes a Ponzi scheme. So we have to get back, in order for what we speak to now, for those systems to actually take hold in society, we have to find some simplistic systems, one being economic, that will uh, create a, an abundance uh, so we can have leisure time to ponder these things. The problem has been we haven't had the leisure time to do that. People are spinning around in these little uh, you know, like like a hamster in their little wheel of survival. And we have to get off that wheel of survival and get into abundance. So I, again, I have to talk about, you know, the Lewis Kelso and CESJ. I think they're doing a remarkable job. And, you know, what I am as a futurist and working with the social media, I believe it's going to come from the bottom up. I, I think the, the political 
uh, the intellectual, uh, all have failed to bring it to the masses. So it's going to have to have a system that the masses can understand and actually experience it and taste it so they can put the influence onto the intellectual and into the political to make it happen. Well, okay, but I, I think we ought to pause for a second, and uh, we've thrown out a couple of terms here that are uh, pretty staggering in the implications, because we largely see things through the historically inherited patterns of history, and what we're talking about, when you talk about, I, I don't think it should be just cavalierly thrown out, it should be studied, put up on the table along a lot of other things, and it was actually, in my thinking, uh, even though I didn't have a sense of how that might be achieved or something, or the economics or the politics of it, uh, was brought up by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller had uh, done comprehensive thinking and had the idea of doing, uh, for one thing, he had the idea of uh, anticipatory design science. Throughout most of his life, he wasn't very political at all. He was no. uh, interested in designing artifacts or systems. Sure. He invented the famous uh, geodesic, geodesic, no. geodesic structures. They're all over the world now and everything, and that's the most efficient way to enclose space. And he modeled that on molecular structures existing within the natural order. And, yes. and he also had the concept of doing more with less through good design. I think a lot of his thinking was laying the groundwork for what they call nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is just emerging now in full force, and you can create new materials. They can have uh, building materials that are, you know, a thousand times the, the strength of steel and weigh practically nothing. So there's all kinds yeah, of new materials. So you can do. Scientifically, we have no problems, Harold, uh, well, achieving, I think, the, the greatness of uh, all the potential, um, well, of the capabilities. And theoretically, you know, we, we have transcendent scarcity. Well, now, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's, that's what I wanted us... And okay. and I like to, you know, kind of... Um, we have a difference of opinion on how we're going to achieve, uh, in a massive sense, uh, how we're going to get to that level. But, you know, like Mashiach Kaku said that, you know, we have man one, man two, man three. Uh, we may not make it to man one, but if we do... That means that uh, education will be free, we'll control volcanoes. There's so many things that we have a potential to do. So I'm really interested in, in how do we bridge on a simple way to get to these levels so we can uh, have what science has the capability of doing to have not only it, it happen, but also own that capability. Well, yes, okay, now you're... That's the CESJ with well, Center for Economic Facilities. Yeah, and that, get, so. that, that does get over to the economics of it and everything. But yeah. what I wanted to do was back off and say, let's not be so easily cavalier. Because when you're talking about transcending material scarcity, right. uh, I would go back again. Well, there were some of the words of uh, James Joyce and some of the other great poets, and McLuhan saw it and others. He was a great fan of James Joyce and... William Blake and so forth, but mm -hmm. he, he saw it in a very large context. And one of the things outside of the work of his, uh, of his vision in terms of as an architect, he was a comprehensivist and called himself that. He also brought into the common language of uh, not only citizens, but also the scientific community. He would give a talk back in the 50s or 40s or something to a group of scientists or learning or what do they call them, STEM people and everything, but uh, they, and he would say, how many people have heard of the word synergy? And his right, basic right. book was the geometry, the synergetics, the geometry of reality, and he had a feeling, and so the word synergy is the behavior of systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts, and it works with string theory now because it comes out in terms of being a resonancy between interaccommodated systems, and it seems to be operative all through the material and organic world. And so yeah. it's a model that can yeah, be well, used. If you talk like that to uh, the common person, they're going to go, what? And huh? 
I, I don't I don't think that's so unable to be understood. But the point being is also in his work uh, when he was he was at Black Mountain College World he was a a real intellectual, a comprehensivist, right. pattern recognizing, not specializing. He didn't get um, uh, wooed or uh, into being some specialist, which has become the overwhelming uh, nature of what's called the educational process now through a process of uh, divide and conquer, everybody becomes so highly specialized that they can, there's very practically no systems thinking going on or place within the educational process for comprehensive thinking. But he came up with the idea of, uh, of what he called it, uh, he was at Southern Illinois University, he called mm -hmm. it, um, he called it world game. And they took with major intellectual thinkers and so forth, and they made a study of human, of, of natural resources, of the earth, of science, and the right. human society within that and so forth. And he, uh, they, they came up with a pattern of understanding um, the evolution. And one of the things that he dealt with was this question we've been hinting at, but he was hinting at the idea that you could almost make it axiomatic, I think, if you say, uh, back again, quoting to another sage and poet, Cervantes, had mm -hmm. said that there are only two classes. We talk a lot about classes, and it, we get into the reality of the world, historical and sociological and political and economic uh, organization that we tend to think of. But he said there's only two classes, haves, the haves and the have-nots, and throughout all, as far as we can tell, uh, it's a little hard to know the patterns of, uh, of uh, early mankind, a homo sapien. It appears we evolved around 200,000 years ago, but for most right. of that time we were wandering around embedded in nature, and uh, the, the, the and that we we're not real familiar with that, although the genome is making it possible to trace that now, which right. is interesting. But it took the development of what is called the Neolithic Revolution along about eight or 10,000 years ago, the invention of uh, agriculture and animal husbandry that gave uh, surplus from the just food quest. I think we were prey of the big cats for a long time, 180,000, 190,000 years. Didn't really happen until we invented uh, the steam engine. Well, you're uh, jumping ahead, I would suggest. Well, in I that. know, I know, but you know, yet yeah, well, we 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 did grow, you know, through many generations. Um, but I, I think the steam engine was the first technological. Uh, piece of equipment that really gave a surplus in a, in a, in a major way that, that uh, allowed us to have more leisure time. Well, uh, well perhaps, yeah. but let me, let me yeah. just say that sure. the, the, that, that, that ushered, it was a, it's the magic year in terms of historical development, that would be the beginning of what was to become we call the Industrial Revolution, Absolutely. and uh, that, then you also had uh, you know, you had revolutionary ferment, you had a bunch of bumpkins across the Atlantic Ocean, in the European case anyway, and there were other examples around the world, but uh, they, they had had certain ways in which a political legitimacy for a certain group of people was determined, and uh, they made a revolution across the ocean from uh, Europe in the United States, and we fought a war over the fact that things were evolving and um, so forth. But even back to Fuller again, in his world game findings, they had findings, he had a chart that he had set up when he was working with Mr. Luce. He had a chart set up, the findings, a pattern. And of that, he said, coming out of all of human history, which is 200,000 years, right. it, it, it would have not been appropriate to say, in the sense that it relevant now or was becoming relevant uh, mm -hmm. to say that we had, as you and I have said, all, too cavalierly I would submit, uh, we have transcended material scarcity because right. throughout all of that time, including even the periods when you had civilization, the pharaohs and Mesopotamia and, and Greece and all of that, 
you usually had, once you had civilization, they needed to have large numbers and were able to have large numbers of people to work uh, the, the, the system. But you always had throughout all of human history a small, relatively small group of people in a leadership position assuming political legitimacy because they had the technological edge of being able to coerce people if necessary. They could co-opt them and they could spread their culture and so forth. But it was only a few people that were living in a ca ca castle, whether it was the pharaohs of Europe or uh, of, of Egypt, Absolutely. of Egypt, Absolutely. and then a thousand years of Rome ruling, with Jesus having some objection to that, and other people, and being right. and Spartacus being put up on the cross and all that, and then after Rome fell, you had a thousand years where political legitimacy was assumed to be held by uh, by the kings and the royalty and the hereditary families of Europe and the similar thing in other parts of the and world. Don't forget the Pope and all those, uh, the, you know, you know the, the spiritual side got involved in that part of the game too. I, 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 yeah, I think, you know, yeah. Like yeah. the Vatican and all that. But the thing is, is that, you know, the Greeks had interesting things when the, when the loons learned how to loon themselves uh, uh, what was it? How did it go? Yeah, let me deal with that because that was a thing of Aristotle, and I think uh, that, and right. that's getting over a little bit into the Kelso thing, uh, mm -hmm. which is a different take on things economic. But he used to quote Aristotle to the effect that uh, even Athenian, you know, in Periclean Greece, it was mm -hmm. still a it was still a slave society by and large, and right. there people were slaves, and then you had a few people you know, philosopher kings and so forth, and everything. But he, and he said that it had to have that in order for the goods, let's say the fine textiles or whatever there had to be, that, 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 the, that the leadership class was enjoying, uh, that had to be done by slavery. And he right, said it so would ever, no, but let me make the point. But he said it, all, it would ever more be so that you would have to have slaves or serfs they were called in the feudal period where the people were living the kings were living in a big castle on the hill and most of the people were wallowing around in the mud under very arduous conditions of bowing down to royalty or being subsumed or being co-opted with certain kinds of uh, religious things that gave they ended up in louis the 14th or 16th saying that it was the divine right of kings that it was linked to so spirituality could be um, co-opted also, and we're, and so, um, and he said it would ever more be so uh, necessary for there to be some to live well and to have the advances of civilization un until the loom learned to weave or the plectum learned to play, which is a heralding of the displacement of labor that Mr. Keynes talked about. And yet you have all, and the revolution made in the United States of America, which is the continuation of a political process where a few people had all the advantages and they set up a system in their own interest, just as that happened throughout all of history. One of my favorite lines of James Joyce is that history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. So it was a long process climbing up Mount Sisyphus. And back, back to Mr. Fuller, in his thing, he charted that thing with the world game, saying uh, axiomatically, we threw out the idea a moment ago, that uh, there would be, through time, and particularly coming into the modern period, there would be a higher percentage, and this is not talking about necessarily the reality, which you, you see, but uh, uh, particularly uh, dealing with the capability which has a different quality than does the actual reality because you're always uh, tethered to institutions that were formulated in a condition that is being qualitatively transformed. But he said um, they would, they would, uh, they, they would, they, that, that, that that would be... time. Yeah, yeah. That they, no, he said that there would be a higher percentage of the world population, particularly at this moment, and I did a program once with Isaac Asimov, the great futurist and the creator of the laws of robotics and so forth. Mm -hmm. And he said in the program that this, it's a little hard to get your mind around. 
that this is the defining generation. After 10,000... It, it could be the defining generation. Um, no, it you know, is. No, he said it is. And there's know, some I reason know, for that. But I Fuller know, said, let me just get... Stephen, let me just, let me just finish. In that world game, and he, he had a measurement of it. He could measure it. And it had some validity. And it's certainly a kind of thing that could be continued. And you take into account world population trends, resources, new technologies, all the kind of things that this conference held just this month, uh, and so forth, and that there would be, almost axiomatically, a higher percent, certainly at a level of capability, a higher percentage of the world population, the whole of the world population, within an ecological order, that could be seen to be a have as opposed to a have not, and he said throughout all of history, it was about 1% that were haves, and then it got into the 20th century, it got up to about 10%, in terms of capability by the First World War, and then it got up to about 20% by the Second World War, it was moving hyperbolic, and then it was moving, uh, it was, and then he, he coined the term, or no, he, he, he put a chart and he said that um, uh, in 1952 projected 10 year, 20 years into the future, when we were going to cross, at the level of capability, the ability to provide life support in all of its manifestations, and back again to defining what does it mean to be a have, that's a big issue that ought to be discussed, but that we would cross that line around 1972, and he lived out his life saying we'd cross that line around the, it had been accelerated, around 1970. And Absolutely. 1970 was the same time that through modeling that can be scientifically tested and so forth, the weapon systems by which the leadership class had asserted and assumed their political legitimacy that gave an advantage to one tribe over another to go and conquer or do whatever they wanted or influence, uh, uh, was that, that the weapon systems became finally species lethal for the whole of the Homo sapiens species about 1970. So well, 1970 was, was a major breakpoint. It was a major breakpoint existentially. There was no and way that could have been achieved. That in that. What happened? We had uh, Woodstock, which is. The well, other no, there was a. Well, Woodstock was a big party. It was wonderful. Richie Havens, we well, just it was mentioned. More than a party. This is where a lot of people don't understand in the spiritual sense. It's the awakening of people to have peace and love and the potential that that we have, you know, transcended scarcity. And that we could have love instead of war to create our abundance. So, Back. so all these things were burnt, you know, were blown in the wind. Bobby and, uh, Dylan had it down, didn't he? His poetry boy, he had it down perfect. Yeah, he did. <coughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so all these things were blowing in the wind, and 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 then uh, then uh, you know the political uh, parties always screw things up. So we have the capabilities. We have to find our moral ground, our moral capabilities, and to initiate what our potentiality is. And that's, you know, my specialty as a futurist and 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 uh, to create the bridge to bridge the systems that we need to have the capabilities, to allow us to have these capabilities uh, to the masses. And once the masses get a hold of it, uh, that's when we go to the next paradigm. I think we can do it in five years. I, I wish I could talk about what I'm launching now, but I'm in quiet time, so yeah. I have to be careful. We have to do this in another show. But we all can be owners, and we all can own the capital production, and we must demand that. Well, okay, Stephen, but I... capability now. Okay, Stephen, I understand your words and everything, but what I'm trying to say is I think we'd be wise not to be too cavalier on that or not no, to not be cavalier. selling it short. Uh, You're selling cavalier. it short. Uh, it is actually, I'm, I'm being very specific, not cavalier. We have the capability to transcend scarcity within the next five years if the systems are put in place to allow all people to own the capital production. Okay, well that's very good, and that gets that gets around to a different way in which capital would be formed, 
And the way uh, capital or technological instruments could be formed, the Science Channel shows us that things are, the robotics are coming along so strong now, and it gets we into... We have to be able to own those things. If we're not involved in ownership of the capabilities, which all these you know shows like the wormhole and the Science Channel with Michelle are discussing... If Morgan Friedman, capabilities, too. We're screwed, okay? Well, because then the one percenters will be uh, entrenched in the technology. We have to own that technology before it becomes available for the masses. Well, with due respect for what is called the progressive community, uh, there, we have, and, and, and it gets down to practical things which are worth considering and everything, but I think it's worthwhile, particularly for the uh, intellectual community to present things in a way that can be understood by the mass of uh, the, all of the people, and that has to be nested within an ecological order, which is also promising and also capability. But we have to have a system that can be understood. And there's been a, there's been, we have two different kinds of ways of seeing things. Uh, one is the private sector, which is corporate profit and uh, private sector profit making. And then you have governmental possibilities, and that's a dialectic that's being worked out. And we have to understand, what we have to understand in my thinking is that we have come into a new order of things, that it was an existential qualitative transformation that was being signaled along about that time, 1970. We've been wandering in the wilderness with institutions inherited out of a historical pattern that the, ins that, that the assumptions of which have become, obs have become obsolete in terms Absolutely. of the future. Now that's such Absolutely. a, but the, the, to say, Stephen, we've transcended scarcity, it's never mentioned as a possibility. It's only no. assumed, and the institutions all reify or reestablish the assumptions of the institutions, all of which were formulated historically within a condition of scarcity that goes back to the beginning of uh, homo sapien existence. So it's not just a little historical change, like a new democratic party or Republican or yep, something. Yep. And a lot of people uh, of the progressive community have the idea that labor is uh, uh, there. And, and so they make investments in the, uh, in the business community. They can make an investment that will pay for itself. And, you know, investment bankers know they can make an investment in something that's going to pay for itself in maybe five, six years into the future. So instead of depending always only on past savings, which gave an advantage to the already ensconced interests and so forth, uh, are then it's throwing off then a great uh, earning power that that private sector stock ownership, if you want to call it that, is throwing off uh, you know um, uh, profits uh, into the future. And that is the thing, the labor theory of value informs much of that, that is wonderful for everyone to be working. And the only way they have to distribute income to the mass of the people is through what they have, a, a, a job. The assets are increasingly responsible are for production. systems that we have that are uh, just spoken about by our congressmen and the president of the United States they all have these outdated modalities that they speak, and it's going to be up to the futurists like you and Hertzwell and, and hopefully myself uh, in the near future to bring uh, an understanding that can curl in. Uh, you know, we also have like the Venus Project. We also have yes, the Zeitgeist the movement. Yeah, this is all accumulating uh, uh, an energy that our people are looking for the paradigm shift. And, and it's up to us as intellectuals uh, and futurists to create that mechanism that allows the masses to own this. And Yeah, uh, and, and let me just know, say, we're, we're running out of time, right? And the, the trickiest right. job not only not is this for, uh, the trickiest job collectively for the homo sapien species is to, um, is to we're now at an existential moment. We've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years since we've uh, uh, crossed that line to about 1970. 
And uh, we have to have something that can be liberating of the whole of the Homo sapiens species within an ecological context that takes into account labor, I mean, takes into account the natural order uh, thing. And then, but the trickiest part of all is that uh, we have a system that can do that, but also one that is going to be able to get the attention of maybe a few halting people within the established order who can understand the wisdom of the need to form capital in a way that is democratizing to everybody so that they will have a system by which they can have income by something other than their labor. They've Absolutely. already they've already co-opted the educational system, seeing it as an investment. So kids are coming out with huge debt and so forth. It seems like a thing that's only you know that, like that. But we need to have that, and that's the thing for our political and intellectual and general leadership. And so Absolutely. we're at a time of qualitative transformation. I think Lewis Kelso. I think you're right. And Norman and Bob Ashford and Patricia Kelso and others. Russell Long picked up on it. We've got some uh, ability to expand ownership as a way of distributing demand or buying power to the masses of the world of what can be produced. And I think we Absolutely. need that desperately. So, well, I, I'm asking all intellectuals if, uh, you know, that are interested in making the paradigm shift to Facebook me at Steve Neskis. Um, Good. And we do have we do have a mechanism that I'm developing and launching within the next year that could actually bring uh, that mass uh, following to put the political pressure, create an understanding for the masses of what you spoke spoke about. We do need something that can happen, and I think I've been you know I work with you I don't know what over almost 25 years. Yeah, there, something like that. Years. And, um, you know, I've been working on this project for a long time to see the mechanism uh, unfold and yeah. watching it unfold. And we are at a qualitative change. Okay, Stephen, I hate to cut you short, but there's a tyranny of time in all of these matters. <laughs> and we've come to the end of the program. So it's really good to talk to you. We brought up a number of things. Uh, they should be up. There should, should, should be some things up in the table of consideration that we've hinted at here, and we should do it not very cavalierly or anything, but if we have transcended scarcity, that's a major qualitative, and it led to Buckminster Fuller saying we've got to get something like an operating manual for Spaceship Earth. Stephen, sorry, we've run right out of time. So once again, say goodbye, Stephen, and we invite you to tune in next week, we'll, or tomorrow, we'll be coming back in conversation. But that's it, so good to talk to you. We've got to keep doing this, Steve, okay? Say you got about tw five seconds. Okay, Harold, it's my pleasure. Peace to everybody, and let's make it happen. All right, good, I good idea. Thank you for viewing. We'll be coming back again tomorrow in conversation. The guests have been Stephen Estafios Neskis. Thank you very much for viewing. Okay. <laughs>